Hi there, I have a letter cast here. You may know me from my stories, you may know me from YouTube, you may know me from your local coffee shop, or maybe you don't know me at all. Regardless of how our paths have crossed, I just want to say, welcome to my podcast, Indie Authors Connect. This podcast is for any listeners looking to expand their support for small name creators and discover tomorrow's bestsellers today. In each episode, I introduce you to new indie authors from a wide range of genres in fiction and nonfiction, as well as graphic novels and webcomics. Each episode features a new author. Learn about their works and subscribe for a chance to receive a copy of our next interviewee's book completely free. I will be posting a new episode on the first Friday or Saturday of every month, and you can find me on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. Each episode will also be available in video format on YouTube, in text format on my blog at iLettercast.com, and if you want the links to all of those, just subscribe to my weekly newsletter at iLettercast.com, under the link titled Get Free Books. You can also subscribe to my Instagram account at i underscore lettercast, my Twitter account at iLettercast, and my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash iLettercast. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Indie Author Connection. We're on episode two, and today we are interviewing G.L. Robinson, who has been writing in the Regency romances genre for just over two years. Um, She currently has nine books out, and she is here to talk to us today about her newest book, um, The Lord and the Cat's Meow. So without further ado, let's go ahead and invite her in. Um, (laughs) One second, my cat is trapped in the closet. Hold on. Okay. You are not supposed to be in there. Come on. Such a butt. Oh, Oh, what a great cat. (laughs) Yeah. So speaking of cats, um, you're here to talk to us about the Lord and the Cat's Meow. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about like your story, how you kind of became a writer and how you started. Oh boy. Okay. Well, um, I, it's, it's, it's an, it's a sad sort of funny story. Um, uh, I went to boarding school when I was uh, young. I was there from the age of eight to 18 because my father worked in Africa. And which was fairly common in those days. I mean, we're talking about the 50s, right? And um, my sister was with me. And um, in the evening, the night, we had to go to bed, of course, pretty early. In fact, as I recall, we were in bed by like eight o'clock. Um, okay. We used to read romances under the covers, you know, when we weren't supposed to be. So, and we particularly liked Regency romances. And they're the ones that um, they focus on the time when King George III who is the one who lost the colonies of America, you probably remember. (laughs) He was uh, suffering from mental defects. So um, the regent, that was his son, who was going to be George IV, ultimately, he took over from him during the period, and that's called the Regency period, when the regent was in charge, not the king. Um, And now George uh, George IV, the regent, um, was a really, a really, a real party guy. I mean, he... He he would have really been good in, you know, San Francisco in the 60s. That was his way of life. (laughs) Uh, Lots of parties, lots of girlfriends, lots of mistresses. Um, And um, so 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 London was very in the old fashioned use of the word, very gay at that time, very happy. Um, Of course, there were enormous differences between the rich and the poor, which is something I get into a little bit in some of my books. But um, anyway, so my sister and I used to read those things and we really liked them. Now, fast forward until 2018, I'm living in America. I've been here for 45 years. My sister was still in England, although we were still very close and she died unexpectedly. Um, And I didn't even get back to England in time to see her before she died, which really still upsets me. But um, the day after, I did get back for the funeral. Then the day after her funeral, seriously, I kid you not, I sat up in bed with this story, like whole and entire in my head. Wow. And I'm sure it was her. I'm sure it was her. I, I was, it, like from beginning to end, it took me three weeks to write it. Um, it. Not this particular one, not The Lord and the Cat's Meow. That was my first book. Okay. But so I published it. Um, didn't know what on earth I was doing. So needless to say, it sank like a stone. I think maybe three people read it. Um, But (laughs) ever since then, I wised up and and I've kept on writing though ever since. And The Lord and the Cat's Meow is the latest. And it's number 10. That's awesome. Since 2018. So 
it's been it's been a ride and i tell you i absolutely love it i love to write i wish i'd done it all my life now i should have <laughs> i think that's really cool though that you like you really just she came to you and gave that to you i definitely really believe in did. metaphysical stuff like that you yeah know? it is and they even i now you know my books are sort of funny-ish they're sort of witty perhaps is better than they're not belly laugh funny but I, when I'm writing them, I do make myself laugh. Really, I do. I laugh out loud sometimes. And I know my, I can feel my sister on my shoulder. Yeah, she's laughing too, because we laughed at the same things. And so she is always with me. And, and maybe that's why I like it so much, you know. Um, it started out, um, I think, as a form of grieving, truly. Um, and it's gone on now as a form of just sort of being close to her, I suppose, is what I could say. That is absolutely beautiful. So that kind of probably feeds into like really what your goal is with your books, like in, in how you present them to the world, right? Yes. Well, I really would like to tell you, JB, that I am looking to write the great American novel, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm I'm looking, I'm looking to give people a happy half an hour. That's if I can do that, I think I'll have achieved something. Because, you know, God knows life is hard, isn't it? It's yeah. harder now than ever. I, I really do believe that. I mean, I'm going to be 75 and I can tell you things are harder now than they were when I was 15. I, I, I look back on it and I think social media has made things harder. I mean, I, in some respects better, because of course I wouldn't, in, my, in when I was 15, the only way I could have contacted you would have been by letter but <laughs> across the ocean it would have taken two weeks to get there and oh, th 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 now we can talk like this and so clearly there are some advantages but mostly um i think life is harder so my books really are intended to make people smile and have a fun you know i was a french professor you know and i i've been retired now for 10 years but um I, when i was a french professor i taught french literature Okay. which is not renowned for its humor. I will <laughs> say that about French literature. I would not say- All the angst with the French, it is, right? it is, especially the 20th century existentialist, which you know <laughs> is just loaded yeah. with angst. I mean, the, the real metaphor is Sisyphus pushing that boulder up the hill. You know, the, French, the myth, the Greek myth, where mm -hmm. he pushes the boulder up the hill and it gets to the top and it falls right down on him again. He has to start all over again. Well, that is pretty much <laughs> the metaphor. That, I feel like that kind of estimates <laughs> life right now, just a well, little bit for exactly. a lot of people. You, uh, then aren't I right? That if, if, if honestly, if that's how you feel life is, then then you don't need to read existentialism. It would just feed in and make you feel <laughs> worse. So yeah. that's why I, th I like my books to be, you know, to make people laugh a little bit and um and i mean i could i could teach you you know the stranger by you know good old camus if you like but i think you wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> better off with <laughs> better off with the lord and the cat's meow which will make you laugh definitely that sounds actually it sounds like a great read <laughs> shall um, i read do you want me to read you a bit yeah that would be spectacular have you yeah. um okay I'll, I'll read you a little bit from the lord and the cat's meow um i should tell you that um it's 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 a love story of course they're all romances so needless to say and they're all happy endings so everybody always ends up with the right person although the road to get there is not always smooth in this particular case we have a lord who is very sort of lazy and pretty much good for nothing except he's good looking and got a lot of money <laughs> I think we all dresses, know two people like that. He dresses great. I mean, he really is. I mean, he's an absolute model of perfection in his clothing. Um, and um, he uh, he gets engaged to a woman who you know from the outset this is not the woman for him, right? We the or we the readers know that, but he doesn't. Um, and into his life comes this little person, little woman, and I should say I am six feet tall, so I'm. This is not an image of me, all right. This little person <laughs> comes into his life, um, and um, she is an animal rights activist. The fact of the matter is that um, the first animal rights law in the world was enacted in Britain in 1822, okay. and it's against that background 
that I write, I wrote this book. I, would, I was actually going to publish it next year because it's obviously 22 and right. it would have been some sort of centenary, but oh well, I guess it would have been what, 80, 90, 300 years centenary. But um, I, uh, I didn't because I like it too much. Uh, so she comes to, to see him because she has seen a horse being dreadfully mistreated in the street and she finds out from the guy that it came from his stables. So she comes to take him to task, okay? Um, and if I can find the piece of paper, I'll read it to you. Here it is. So she comes into the, she's, she's shown into the drawing room and he comes in a little bit later. So her name is, her name, by the way, is Nina. She's named for one of my granddaughters. Gotcha. Miss Chatterton, he said, looking down at her from his very superior height and deciding that Minton, that's the butler, had been quite right. She was very attractive in a wild kind of way. She had unruly brown curls with a hint of red that had probably been put into some sort of coiffure that morning, but whatever it was, it hadn't lasted. They fell willy-nilly from her bonnet onto her forehead and cheeks, framing a face that owed nothing at all to artifice. She had deep brown eyes with long dark lashes, a ridiculous little nose, a mouth that was a shade too wide, and as Minton had observed, a most determined chin. She looked not unlike a rather dirty china doll, for her cheek bore a dark smudge. And Elliot noticed that it was not only her boots that bore traces of straw, her serviceable cloak had bits and pieces sticking from it as well. Elliot Devin, he said, how may I be of service to you? Wilhelmina Chatterton, said his guest, removing a well-worn glove and holding out her hand, which she gracefully bowed over, though I'm usually called Nina. Then she continued tartly, you, Lord Devin, may be of service to me by ceasing to put advertisements in the newspaper to sell your horses when you have ridden them lame and have no more use for them. She removed her hand, which he was still holding, staring at her in a bemused fashion, and picked up the London Gazette. She thrust it at him, pointing at the offending column. Sure enough, looking at where her dirty, it must be said, finger was pointing. He read, selling a good riding horse, now superfluous to requirements, buyers may address themselves to the stables in the mews of number 11 Grosvenor Square. I found this advertisement from a couple of days ago. You will not deny, I hope, that this is your address. If the poor animal had been useful as a riding horse, no doubt you would have put it up at Tattersall's, said Miss Chatterton with a light kindling in her eyes. The fact you advertised it here shows you were expecting to sell it to anyone who would use it any way they liked. I yesterday rescued what I believed to be this horse from a drayman who was too stupid to see it had an ulcerated hoof and was in dreadful pain. Her brown eyes filled with tears, which she angrily brushed away and continued with, with increasing passion. Your stable sold the suffering animal as simply needing to be reshod. It was the purest chance I saw it in the street and was able to buy it from the brute who would have continued to whip it even though it couldn't move. It was cruelty of the worst kind. I have come to tell you that I'm making a report on the matter to the constabulary. You must know that last year Parliament passed a law making cruelty to animals punishable by a fine. The fine will no doubt be laughable to a man of your wealth and consequence. But I imagine an article in the newspaper mentioning you by name will not be so laughable. Lord Devon was struck less by Miss Chatterton's threat of unpleasant publicity than by the fire in her eyes. She was not of an imposing stature, but as she spoke, throwing back her shoulders and raising her chin, he found it impossible to take his gaze off her. My dear Miss Chatterton, you must know I do not deal with the day-to-day -day running of my stables, he said. I have a large number of horses. I'm completely ignorant of this advertisement and in fact surprised since I believed our superannuated or unfit animals were returned to our estate in the country to be put out to pasture. Then let us go at once and determine whether the animal I rescued was indeed yours. I don't know why the drayman would have lied, but one can never be sure in such circumstances. People will say anything to get out of trouble. And she fixed him with a look that gave him no doubt that she was talking about him as much as the drayman. I assure you, I have no need to lie about such an insignificant matter. Insignificant matter, she cried. 
to you perhaps, living in luxury with no doubt scores of people to dance attendance on you, but to the poor horse it was otherwise. He was in constant pain and had nothing but misery to look forward to. But I, Lord Devin drew himself up short. Why was he arguing with this termagant, pretty though she was? Besides, he thought, with a rare moment of self-criticism, he was surrounded by scores of people who did dance attendance on him. Then the thought of the butler dancing made him smile. I see that amuses you, Lord Devon. Miss Chatterton was outraged. Oh, no. I pity poor Lady Devon if the contemplation of the misery of God's creatures is a source of fun for you. There is no Lady Devon, madam. He was shaken out of his habitual calm and could not stop himself. And if there were, I may tell you at once, she would have nothing to complain about. That I very much doubt if my observation of your character is anything to go by, answered his fierce critic. There. So there's a bit from when they first meet and you can see it's not very auspicious. So I don't know if you know this about me. Um, I picked up my first romance novel, I think I was eight years old. Okay. Um, and I consistently read almost only romance and uh, like Black Beauty and classics and stuff like that. That's right, right. Mm -hmm. um, all the way up through like uh, freshman year in high school for us is uh, I was 14 years old. Um, and so like as as you're reading this to me, I'm like having flashbacks from like all the romances that I read and like what I love about that little passage that you chose to read, I think it's the perfect passage, is like that is when the reader falls in love with her, I think. I have not read the rest. I did buy your book, by the way. I have it. It's, oh, did you? Oh, thank you. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate um, it. But yeah, so like I think that's probably like when the reader falls in love with her. I think that's a just excellent like way to show her yeah, character. Exactly. Because um, she really does I love care her. about animals more than she cares about herself. I mean, she's there she is in, you know, she's not, it's not that she's poor, she isn't. Um, she's, you know, she's actually comes from a slightly aristocratic background herself, she but she doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, about all that. And then she ends up rescuing this cat. That's why it's called the Lord and the Cat's Meow is because they, um, she, she and this Lord, they end up actually becoming quite friendly, but he's engaged to this other woman, I told you. And um, uh, so there's a, f they, there's a, f a little group of them go to visit this place, which you can still go to in London, it's, it's, well, it's outside of London, called um, Strawberry Hill, which was a, a house, a, ma a mansion, um, built by Horace Walpole, who was an author um, in the late 1700s, and he wrote um, gothic novels, you know, the ones where the, um, the heroine is rescued, you know, from a tower, and the uncle or evil uncle is trying to sell her to the highest bidder, that type of thing. I mean, that's, that's the, the gothic novels. But anyway, he wrote those. Um, and so, uh, of course, <laughs> Um, uh, Nina is fascinated by this because, you know, she loves gothic novels, whereas the fiancé of Lord um, Devin there, um, she's a very sort of proper young lady and she thinks it's all a load of nonsense. And there again, you know that, Chena, that, that Nina is a far nicer character because she's very emotional, that's why she loves these gothic novels. Anyway, they go there, long story short, and they, she finds this kitten hidden underneath the printing press upon which Walpole's books were printed. Oh. And so, of course, she names the cat Horace because Horace Walpole right. and takes him back to London. It's a poor little thing is nearly dead. And, and she forces him pretty much on Lord Devon because nobody else will take the cat. And she can't take the cat because her aunt, with whom she is living, is allergic to cats, so she can't. And she didn't think about that when she rescued it. She just said, because they want the people in the in the in the mansion wanted to drown it. And she's no, no, you're not going to drown the cat. She takes the poor little thing in her arms and carries it back in the carriage back to London, um, but then doesn't know what to do with it. So she foists it on Lord Devon, and he, for the first time in his life, has a responsibility for something. 
And it's really the making of him, you see, because he has to make sure this cat doesn't die because he doesn't dare to face Nina. If it does. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> because she's already fierce enough. <laughs> um, so, and she's only little, but she's very fierce. Um, and so uh, then Horace, of course, grows up to be a very, very beautiful cat, not unlike yours, except a be- different color. <laughs> and yeah. on, I have, I have, I was lucky enough. One of my readers found me a fantastic portrait, um, an oil painting of a cat playing on a desk, um, mm. and that's what is the cover of the book. Actually, is the, one of my readers found that. I had, I had a cover which was pretty ghastly, and she found a much better one. <laughs> and, that's awesome. Um, and so there's there we have and of course it is Horace the cat who doesn't at all like his fiance and if that ends up ripping her gown oh, no. uh, during uh, a, a ball which is held to celebrate their their um, engagement um, and she storms off in horror and says it's the cat or me well of course it's the cat not her in the end um, and it all works out of course but I I, I really I must say I like I don't, I've never had a cat. Um, and I've never, I couldn't have a cat. I never had one when I was growing up because I was in boarding school. Yeah, yeah. couldn't have it. Good Lord, we didn't have a, didn't, didn't, didn't have a fly. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then since I've been sort of grown up, uh, I was working um, in London and then I, and then my boss came in to the um, office one day and said, it was just when Britain joined the common market which, um, you know, was way back, it was what it was called way back then um, in the early 70s. Um, and he said, does anybody here speak French? Well, I, put, I said, yes, I do, because the convent I went to was run by French nuns. And right. so I learned French at school and, um, and so I could speak French. And he said, good, you can go to Brussels next week because we're going to join the European sister organization, but we need you to check it out. Okay. So sure enough, off I went to Brussels and, uh, and then I worked in Brussels. In fact, I met my husband in Brussels. Um, he's an American, but he'd been sent over for, um, he was sent over for, for six weeks to help a guy. And he ended up going, coming back to the States eight years later with a wife, three kids and a house full of furniture. <laughs> That's the story. But in all that time, I never could have a cat. And then, um, then it turns out that actually two of my kids are allergic to cats. So no yeah. cat for me, but I do allergic. have a cat. You're allergic and yet you've got one there in your bed. And no three. wonder you get migraines. Yeah, we have three cats. <laughs> and I'm very allergic. This is not good. <laughs> Definitely not good. Yeah, it's worth it. It's 100% worth it. They are, they, I know they're beautiful, beautiful animals. And, and Horace is fantastic. He gets rid of Hermione, that's the, the, the fiance in no uncertain fashion and um, definitely uh, makes it very clear to Lord Devon which woman he should be marrying, which of course he does in the end. So um, I, I really, and having to invent a cat, I'm glad I invented Horace, let's put it like that. <laughs> I'm I'm super excited to read it. Like I said, it's um it's not on this bookshelf. It's on there's a different bookshelf. We have so many friends who are writers, and oh. we actually have sections in the library that are dedicated to the books that she and I have published, and then books uh, from people who we know. Mm-hmm. And so I went ahead and put <laughs> I put yours in the in that particular okay, the people section. That we know. Okay, well uh, that's great. <laughs> well, I I should I'll um I'll send you a signed one. If yeah, that would be I mean, lovely. I, you know, oh, I'm Thank sure you. one day I'd be I be super famous. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think I think you will. Everybody, you know, deserves at least like 15 minutes of fame. Well, you know what right, I mean? the old Andy Warhol thing, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, the 15 minutes of fame. Yes, I have to say I don't want to be famous. Do you? Uh, I want to be a person who makes an impact on the speculative fiction genre. I don't need to be well known, you know, by like yeah, everyone. That's, that's if I could have a small cult following, that's yeah. kind of what, what I want. I think that's exactly how I feel. That's a very good way of putting it. I, I'd like to make an, Im, an impact on my Regency romance genre, um, yeah. but I don't want to be um, famous to the point where sort of people recognize my name. It must be dreadful. It yeah. must be 
dreadful because you have no no privacy left. You you can't do what you want to do. Yeah, I can't. Just make enough can't money to not. It. I mean, I I have to say, I say to make enough money to not worry about debts. I and I'm retired. I I really don't worry about money. Honestly, not. I mean, I'm not well off, but I can pay my pay my bills. Yeah. Um, um, but don't want to you know, be a starving because, artist. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't want to be a starving anything. Well, that would be very good for me because I might lose weight, but no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be um, a starving artist. I'd like to, I'd actually like to give, to make money so that I could leave it for my grandchildren. That's yeah. what I really would like to do. Um, so that later on when I'm dead and gone, they'll say, oh, look at this. She was a nice old stick. She, <laughs> She left us these books and this money. <laughs> Is that a British saying, a nice old stick? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it must be. <laughs> I'm going to steal that. Sorry, I absolutely adore you. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, um, have you thought about, Jamie, the fact that if you are a writer, you actually will have um, um, a heritage. That is to say, you might not leave money to your you know your the people who come after you but you leave your work yeah. it didn't occur to me you know until quite recently i think i was eight books in and you're like i suddenly second. thought golly gee you know my my grandkids maybe if i'm famous enough in my genre maybe um my grandkids will actually earn a bit of money every month wouldn't that be great when yeah. they're in college and you know get young with young families if they earn a few bob every week it would be fantastic i think there's mm -hmm. a i forget who the philosopher was philosopher um but there was kind of this perspective at one point that um humankind each individual person reaches fulfillment like life fulfillment when they have some sort of legacy and so like in terms of the artist the legacy is you know, not necessarily children, but your work going on and, and having um, immortality through that. Mm -hmm. Well, know. one of Shakespeare's sonnets is that way. Yeah. One of his, his, his sonnets, I think it ends up, um, as long as this lives, and he's talking about the sonnet itself, yeah. as long as this shall live, it gives life to thee. In, you know, in other words, you live as long as your work lives, which in yeah. Shakespeare's case has been a bloody long time. <laughs> right? You think about it. Um, I love Shakespeare. I belong to a Shakespeare group and um, I've been reading it. My first degree was in English. Um, okay. and I, um, yeah, I, I, with the French as a minor, actually. And then I um, went on to do graduate work in, in French. But um, when I came here to the United States, actually, um, because then I became, I was a French professor, as I told you. Um, and, uh, but I've always, I think my first love is still English literature. Yeah. Although for many years I taught French literature, I still think, I still think Shakespeare's the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a reason, right? That, um, he, you know, we, every, everyone references back to him, at least in the Western, in the Western world, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, okay. So, wow. We covered we covered a lot of topics. We still got oh, a little bit more. I have a few more questions for you. Go ahead. Actually, go ahead. I had two. Anything. I had one that was a little off script. It was um, I noticed that you were reading from like paper. So, do you have a preferred writing medium? Like, do you write by hand or like typewriter or do you type on? No, I, I I can't write by hand because I've got arthritis. Uh, I mean, honestly, if you saw my handwriting, you'd realize that. Uh, you know better i don't you know um but no 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 i i type right into a, a word document on my on my laptop okay. and um actually i find laptops amazingly good for writing on they seriously inspire me because the great greatest thing is that you're typing away dick 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 and you think hmm wait a minute did they have rubber on the wheels of the hackney carriages in 1815 all you have to do is like you know make the page small and you go into google you find the information out in about 10 seconds and you're back to clickety clickety click again i think it's the best isn't that great you don't have to like like leave your house and go to the library no exactly you know my inspiration writer is georgette hare i don't know if you ever read her stuff she is 
brilliant, absolutely brilliant. The best writer of Regencies that ever has been and ever will be, in my opinion. Absolutely awesome. brilliant. Heyer, H-E-Y-E-R. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, what was I going to say? She uh, liked, she was actually um, a historian and, and she really wanted to write sort of serious history. And she only wrote the romances to pay the way, because I guess she was married to a guy. I mean, I don't want to misspeak here, but I, I think, anyway, she needed the money. And so she wrote the romances to make the money. Um, and they've long outlived her other historical stuff, but, but she does have a lot of historical reference in her, in her romances, as I do as well. And she obviously would have had to go to the library and go through the stacks and pile through and find stuff. No, nowadays we have it made in the shade. It's yeah. so easy. The only difficulty is you do have to know which sources are good and which are not. Yeah. That's one thing my students had a hard time with when I was teaching sometimes. Yeah, <clears throat> that we actually have, um, I'm in college right now studying psychology and we actually have required courses that teach you how to um, uh -huh. out of vet sources basically yeah yeah absolutely how to just separate the wheat from the chaff yeah. yes my son's a psychologist my oldest son oh, that's awesome he's great he makes me laugh and yeah. i think that's not a thing you can say about psychologists terribly often yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does make me laugh um okay so if there was anything that you could tell your readers what would it be okay it would be don't waste your time worrying about things. D don't always be looking ahead. You know, really carpe diem. I, and I mean that very sincerely. Um, I spent a lot of my life thinking, oh, you know, next week will be better. Next year will be better. Um, when i am got such and such, it will be better. If I lose 20 pounds, it will be better. <laughs> you know, isn't that the one? Um, but, and then, then you have children and they come along and you think, oh, won't it be great when they can sit up? Won't it be great when they can stand up? Won't it be great? And you're looking ahead all the time. The poor little baby is lying there and you're thinking, oh, won't it be great when? And then before you know, they've not only sat up, stood up, started talking, started feeding themselves, but they're out of the house. <laughs> you've yeah. got a job and that's it all three of my kids, I wish I could have them back again as babies. Um, I, so that's, I really say that, try to enjoy the day, really enjoy the day and don't look ahead too much. I mean, I know we have to plan, I understand that, but, um, but really, so that's it, enjoy the day. I think that's really good. Um, okay, and I agree with you. I am a bit of a hypocrite on that because I, a lot of what I'm doing right now in life is planning. It's like laying a groundwork. Yes, for yes, I understand that. And I don't mean that you don't have to do that. Yeah, but, but it's hard not to get caught up in it, you know? And I yeah. think a lot of people don't take the time to just sit and be with themselves. Mm -hmm. um, especially now, you mentioned earlier, like with social media, it's really easy to, instead of sit there and just enjoy the moment, it's really easy to oh, be gosh, like, yes. I'm not doing anything right now. I'm going to go on social media and not be present with yeah. myself. Shall I tell you what, what, JB, what I really think is an essential part of growing up is learning to be bored. Yeah. I know, you know, we always took our, we, we are churchgoers and we always used to force our kids to go to church on Sunday because they never wanted to go. I mean, is there ever a kid who wants to go to church? Tell me that. I, I didn't was, want to go. I did. God knows. I was, I was, <laughs> you did? Well, I, I was did. Up in a convent. We used to have to go to mass every morning. And God knows. Uh, I yeah, the difference um, is I wasn't Catholic. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, no, I'm not a Catholic either, actually. But I just was in a Catholic convent um, to, for a boarding school because my mother thought it would be safe. And she was uh -huh. right. We, you know, seriously, we, we weren't allowed out. Anyway, um, <laughs> Except we used to go, you know that book Madeline, you know those Madeline stories? Yeah, I love yeah. those stories. Well, okay, picture me as Madeline, except I was never the little one. I was always the one in the front, the tallest, because mm -hmm. we always went, you know, um, well, actually, we did it in reverse order. The smallest was in the front and the tallest was in the back. And I was in the back from very early age because I was always so tall. Um, <laughs> but we used to go two by two, you know, we left the house and two in rain or shine. The smallest one was Madeline, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's if so picture me looking exactly like that, going for walks along the coast in the south of England with the other boarding school girls 
Um, so that, that was me. But you see, I was very often bored yeah. in, in the sense of having nothing to do. Um, but you shouldn't equate having nothing to do with being bored because when you have nothing to do is when you turn inside yourself and that's what you really need to do. Um, and so going to church, I always used to say to my son, sons, my youngest son in particular, who's honestly, his bottom is too round. He's never been able to sit still for a minute. <laughs> um, and he, I'd say, sit up, shut up, <laughs> listen up. Say, I don't care whether you like it or not. And, you know, it's a great training because then afterwards in your life, you can fall back on that, that you can be happy and be alone and have nothing to do. And I, that's another thing, I, a message. I'm going to have it on my tombstone. Learn to be bored. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Yeah, my daughter, she's 11 and a half. She's almost 12 now. Gosh. You don't look old oh. enough. You look about 12 yourself. <laughs> uh, she's not biologically mine. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm a stepdad, but um, she, man, it's hard for her to to just sit still and do nothing. Mm, yeah, yeah, mm. more and more so because, because of social media, because that sort of everything changing every 30 seconds, you know. Yeah. Um, thankfully we we keep her pretty much off the internet um mm. she has a few video games that she plays that are not like connected to like outside communities um the pandemic's been really hard but she is able to get like socialization through school they're doing two days like in person mm -hmm. now and she's been feeling a lot better since then i think a lot of her antsiness over the last year has really just been like the same oh, thing yeah. that's been kind of getting all of us which is just the cabin yeah. fever a little yeah. bit very much so very yeah. much so yeah i think it has been hard for everybody less hard though for people like me who um i spent the you know 10 years of my early life from 8 to 18 yeah. on lockdown yeah yeah <laughs> so and, i'm and really good at it <laughs> i'm a hermit so it's not really been that bad for me either right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. an excuse to not leave the house <laughs> cool <laughs> Um, okay, so where can um, where can our audience find your work? Well, I publish on Amazon, so um, you can go um, to my author page, um, which is G L Robinson, just G capital G capital L, because my name is Glynis Louise, and um, the thing is, in England I was always called Glynis, and I really hated that name all my life. So when I moved to um, Europe. Um, and I started basically a new life. I told you I went to work in Brussels. Um, I called myself Louise. So since the age of sort of 25, I've been called Louise. But anybody who knew me before 25 still calls me Glynis. So that's, you know, my whole family, needless to say, and all the friends I had before. So that's why I call myself GL, because then it covers all bases. And then Robinson is my maiden name. So it's GL, capital G, capital L, no spaces, Robinson. That's easy to remember, isn't it? Yes. And also um, I have a website, which is um, romance novels by glrobinson.com. Um, again, it's all one word, romance, all lowercase, romance novels by glrobinson.com. And on that one, um, I'll send you a free short story if you ask for it. And also you can listen to me read the first chapter of all my novels it's on there so if you haven't had enough of my voice which i know gets on people's nerves after a while um you can listen to <laughs> listen to me read my my book so it's gl robinson anyway i honestly so i read my books mainly by listening through audible because i've got um dyslexia and uh i would listen to you read all of your books all the way through i love your voice i think it's but I have a, and, I really, really actually, like the sound of, in particular, your accent, the way that you talk. Well, it, it um, of course, because my books are sort of classic English novels and I have a classic English voice, I have the sort of voice that in England, to be honest, people find sometimes that they don't like it very much because it's sort of what we call, well, when I was growing up, it's called, it was called standard rp standard received pronunciation okay. and the bbc only spoke the way i speak everybody on the bbc okay right then in the early 70s the bbc decided to go 
um, regional. And they um, started to, quite rightly, quite rightly, I'm not, not saying this in any critical way, whatever, um, they, they started hiring people with regional accents. Because my accent, you see, it's not regional. It was all, it was universal. It was like a sort of a, I don't know, Arist well, a, a platonic sort of ideal, if you like, at the time. I'm not saying it is now, I'm just that's what it was at the time. So nobody speaks like me anymore. Everybody has a regional accent, and I, I don't because of the way I grew up. And anyway, I was before that whole um, regionalization thing. Um, so in England, not, not sort of so popular, but for, for my novels, though, I think it's good. And I do intend to make audi audible um, novels um, as soon as I get a minute's time to do so. When, when you do, let me know, and I'll, um, I'll kind of advertise that, because I know a lot of people who, who read by listening. Um, more than yes. One way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I do too, and I, I do think it is it is good. The other thing I don't know whether you've heard about Amazon's. Um, yes, you have because you went to that conference where yeah. I met you. I did. Um, <laughs> that the the, the um, Vela thing, right, which is the yes. episodic novels that is coming out. I'm I'm trying to do an episodic novel as well, oh. um, but I recognise that you need to have. Um, a very strong opening sentence and a, and a cliffhanger for every chapter. Yeah, it needs to be really compelling. It needs to be really compelling. And I don't, uh, I'm not sure that I'm that compelling. It, my stuff tends to, do, it, it, to know, I mean, it tends to evolve more gradually and more sort of in a way naturally. And so I, I, think, with, I um, think that you'll be able to, because you already have a fan base. You mentioned you've already got like a pretty decent, amount of people who read your books you have more people who read your books than I do for sure um <laughs> but um I think that you've got fans who are already going to be interested in in reading your stuff and I think also um anybody who reads romance like especially Regency romance right they they have a typical feel for how things develop mm. um, and so I think I don't think you're going to have any issue on really? Amazon Bella, to be honest. Oh, that's interesting. You should say that because I, I have actually I, about eighteen months ago, I wrote a contemporary crime novel, did and you? it's all. It, oh, I did. No, you'd be hot. And and also, it's from the point of view of an American male. Well, I have lived here for longer than you've been alive, so <laughs> I have every right to to write in in, in sort of American. Yeah. Um, and and also it's got vulgarity it's got sex it's got violence you know it's got it's all the, you know what you'd expect from the average american male to be honest um and, <laughs> and i see how it is <laughs> you, uh, so completely unlike me um and because i can't really publish it under my normal name because i think my fans such as they are would be horrified oh my goodness thinking, what is this I'm thinking of this Vela as being perhaps a good way for me to um, get yeah. into it and maybe have a different name. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think that'd be an excellent idea. Call myself Fred Smith or something. <laughs> you know, though, I would read a novel by Fred Smith. Oh, would you? Oh, there you go, then. Yeah. That's it. That's Definitely. my name. You heard it here first. <laughs> well, speaking of, um, you know, reading and novels, uh, we are running a <laughs> quite long. Um, I'm, I'm okay with it, though. I'm happy about it. Um, so you actually mentioned uh, you'd be willing to give away a free signed copy to one of my yes. fans. Absolutely. Um, so go ahead and tell them how they can get a hold of that. Okay. Well, um, actually, um, I, I don't know whether you have some sort of a triage system or is it anybody who contacts me type of thing? Right, so um, I can actually, I can talk about it if you'd like. Um, basically all, all the people need to do is subscribe at my website, like that's mm -hmm. it. Um, and I have a, the way that it's set up through GoDaddy is I'm able to see the emails of subscribers. I throw mm -hmm. them in a random generator, um, a random number generator mm -hmm. and whoever comes out, uh, selected through that system mm -hmm. is the winner basically so it's super okay. easy yeah so, um, crazy. so then you tell me who it is yeah Do you yep you i email you i reach out i'm like hey and so you you give me their email and, and i can contact them and if they want an yeah. ebook or if they want an uh, well it would be no it's a signed copy so it'd have to be a paper so then or yes i'd contact the person yep and i pay for their address i'll 
Yeah, I pay for shipping and everything like that. Oh, really? No, you don't need to do that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm down to. If you would rather pay for it, I'm cool with that. No, I mean, honestly, don't you know, I'm so wealthy. I'm earning, you know, all this money for my books. (laughs) I mean, to be fair, I am like a college student. Yes, exactly. Uh, (laughs) No, I will pay to ship my own book. I think it's the least I can do for having you let me ramble on (laughs) on your your podcast. (laughs) Uh, I'd be glad to. But basically what it is, is it's a it's a pilot program for this sort of subscription service that mm-hmm. I want to get started, um, where indie authors basically um, once a month, I send out uh, a copy of their book, whichever book that they want for, mm-hmm. to put out for free. Um, and that kind of gives them sort of like a an advertising. Um, mm-hmm. It gives our readers something new and exciting to read, different genre every month. Um, and it gives me just a very little bit of cash, but, (laughs) um, that's kind of, that's kind of what it is to, to get started. So absolutely. Well, I'd be glad to very, very glad to do that and, um, do one a month if you want. I mean, that's fine for me. And I do, I've got 10 of them. So it'd be 10 months. I could, uh, (laughs) have a different one every month. Yeah. Just let me know. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, thank you so much, G.L. Robinson, for being here with us today and sharing your book with the world, books, plural, with the world, um, and for answering so many questions. Okay. Um, if there is there anything you want to say to the readers before we sign off? No, th- well, Zip, thank you. If you actually carried on listening all this while, <laughs> you have great staying <laughs> capacity, and I and I laud you, I applaud you. Um, and thank you to JB for being so kind. This is my first ever podcast, and uh, I hope it won't be my last. Um, although when people hear me, how I rab it on, maybe it will be. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. It really has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and remember, you met her here first on Indie Author Connection Podcast, where we bring you tomorrow's bestsellers today. Good night, folks. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> I crashed my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. You did great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoyed today's interview and want to hear more by other indie authors, feel free to hit that subscribe button. We post new content every month on Indie Authors Connection, as well as access to free and paid content by myself and the other authors interviewed here on the show at ilettercast.com. That's I-L-E-T-T-E-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you subscribe to our newsletter, you actually get a weekly update on all of the content that I'm working on, as well as plenty of free and paid content by other awesome small indie creators. And if you want to be featured, just shoot me an email through that website. Thanks again for listening. And hey, you're wonderful.